Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in the Quran when he says, O oh, you who believe, fear Allah as he deserves to be feared, and do not leave this world except that you are a Muslim. And he also reminds us when he says, O oh, you who believe, fear Allah and speak the truth. Stand up for what is just and what is right. Perhaps if you do so, Allah will direct you to do good deeds and he will take care of your affairs. And whomsoever obeys Allah and his messenger, that indeed they have gained the greatest of all achievements. My dear brothers and sisters, today's khutbah is about leadership in Islam. Being the leader you're destined to be. You know, oftentimes we talk about leadership in a way that we're supposed to shy away from. And that may be true to an extent, as when Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, the famous Sahabi, who came to the Prophet Sallallahu and he says to him, make me in charge of something. He's a senior Sahabi, and he wants some responsibility. But the Prophet Sallallahu recognizes that Abu Dhar is not the right person for the job. He said, إِنَّكَ رَجْلٌ ضَعِيف You have weakness, and he was referring to his emotional weakness, meaning he would get angry really quick, or he would act out of emotion. So he says, he gave some profound advice. He says, leadership, he says, this mas'uliya is an amana. It's a trust. And it's also going to be on the day of judgment, nadama, regret. Because you'll be questioned. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, he says, waqifuhum, innahum mas'ulun, stop them. They have to be asked about what? About everything. Whoever was under their leadership, they will be asked about how they fulfilled that position of leadership. So it's scary when you look at it from that end. But then the other perspective is Yusuf alayhi salam. When he comes out of jail, after having all that experience and Allah preparing him for such a, a big role, he looks and he sees the demise of Egypt. No one knows what they're doing. He sees the dream, he interprets the dream, and he says, I know what to do. He has that experience. So for him, it was an obligation to step up before the whole country was in ruins and essentially all of the surrounding areas. So he tells the king, Put me in charge over the agriculture of the land. I am not only trustworthy, but I also am competent. I know, I've studied this. He lived under the house of the Aziz. He saw how the politics runs. He studied it in jail. He knows these things. He's the person for the job. So he steps up as he should. So what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us about where we stand? Allah encourages us to make a dua in Surah Al-Furqan, that famous dua. رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنْ وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا That dua that we recite in Surah Al-Furqan where Allah is encouraging us to ask, O oh Allah, make from our spouses and our offsprings coolness of the eye and make us leaders for the pious, make us role models for the believing people. So we are not to shy away from being role models, especially in a world where there is no moral compass. And we as Muslims have been given that knowledge. We've been enlightened. We should be leading. Because if we don't, there's going to be much corruption in the land. And that's the exact hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, when he says, Islam began strange, and it will return like it began strange. Then he says, Fatuba lil ghuraba, glad tidings for the strangers. When the Sahaba asked, who were these strangers? Is there any trait that we know about them? He says, الَّذِينَ يُصْلِحُونَ مَا أَفْسَدَ nas." Those who reform what the people have made corrupt. So there's an obligation for us not to shy away, but to step up and offer the people what they don't have of Islam and so forth. But in order for you to be a good leader, and all of us, may, some of you may say, well, this khutbah doesn't apply to me because I'm not really a leader of anything. I don't have a masjid that I'm a leader of or a country. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made all of us leaders in one capacity or another. The famous hadith I ask you to recall of Rasulullah sallallahu where he says, Ala kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulun an ra'yatih. All of you are leaders, are shepherds, he says in this hadith. And all of you are responsible over those flock that are under you. And then he says, Al-Amiru alladhi ala nas ra'in. The Amir, the leader of a country over the people, is a shepherd. And he is, wa huwa mas'ulun an ra'yatihi. He will be questioned about his flock. Wa rajulu And he says, then the man, ra'in ala ahli baytihi. He is a shepherd over the household, right? The family. That's his constituents. And then he says, وَالْمَرْأَةُ رَاعِيَةً عَلَىٰ بَيْتِي بَعْلِهَا 
and the woman is in charge of her husband's home and the children, the upbringing of the children. So in essence, everyone is a leader whether you like it or not. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us an incentive. He says, Seven will be shaded, seven prototypes of people that will receive the shade of Allah on the day of judgment where there will be no shade except Allah's shade. We can't get into all of them right now, but we all know the first one on that list is Imam Adil, a righteous leader. So that's an incentive right there to not only embrace that position that Allah has put you in, but to embrace it and to fulfill the conditions of it. There's many things that you need, and we could go for hours about what you need to be a good leader. We're going to touch over a few things. The first thing, my dear brothers and sisters, is you must know, in order for you to be a good leader, you must embrace the hardships that Allah has put in your way. Don't be someone who complains about the hardships, but rather uses them as opportunities to be better, to be stronger, so he can carry out those responsibilities. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does he say about Ibrahim, for example? He says, وَإِذِ ابْتَلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمَ رَبُّهُ بِكَلِمَاتٍ فَأَتَمَّهُنْ Ibrahim was tested with several things, right? We all know the test of Ibrahim. And Allah says he passed all of them. He embraced them and it stepped up to the challenge. Then what does Allah say? He says, قَالَ إِنِّي جَاعِلُكَ لِلنَّاسِ إِمَامًا Ibrahim, now I have made you a leader over the people. You're worthy to be a leader when you're able to embrace the hardships that are on your way. Right? Same thing with Musa alayhi salam. Musa being 10 years away from his home country as a fugitive, living in the land of Median, with hard work. He had to work really hard out there after growing up in the palace of the Pharaoh. You know, after all this hardship, he sees the fire in the bush. He meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He, he speaks to Allah. And what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a series of things that he says to him? I was with you when your mother threw you in the basket. I'm the one who inspired her. I was with you when your sister was able to get you back to your mother. I was with you when you killed that man and you ran away. I was with you throughout the whole ordeal. He says at the end, I have manufactured you for me. The word manufacture, when you hear that word, you think of a product in a company. And anytime a company is ready to display a product to the people, it has to go through a series of internal tests, audits, make sure there's no defects, make sure it's ready to go. And once it's gone through this rigorous testing within the company, it's now ready to be displayed to the world or to the customers. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala essentially is telling Musa, all of what you went through in the past, it was by design so that I get a product that I can use for a mission that's great to save the people. Same thing with Yusuf alayhi salam. All what he went through was so that Allah can get a product at the end. And that's what's happening with us. You know, when we receive hardships, even small or big, we look at them as opportunities to elevate ourselves because we are going to be needing those skills to be able to lead a family, to be able to lead a, a masjid, a community, whatever capacity that you have leadership in. And what's beautiful, my dear brothers and sisters, is that we'll never be able to lead unless we're connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You want to improve yourself? Go in the Qiyam al-Layl and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like the Prophet ﷺ did. Because at the end of the day, you may think you're making a good decision for the family or for whoever's under your leadership. But you may very well be making a wrong decision. So what is the key? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَئِمَّةً يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا We made them leaders that they guide with our command. So it's, it's the inspiration from Allah. إِلَيْهِمْ فِعْلَ الْخَيْرَاتِ And we inspired them to do good deeds. You know, every good that comes is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every decision that you say, you look back and you say, wow, this was a good decision for my family that I moved here. Or that I put my son in this school. Or that I did this and that. All of it came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All credit, all good needs to be brought back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because at the end of the day, you'll have never been able to do anything on your own. You must first acknowledge that. Look at the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. The Prophet ﷺ was faced with a tough decision. All the Sahaba are pressuring him not to take the deal. But it wasn't his decision. Allah already says, Inna fatahna laka fathan mubina. We have declared a tremendous victory for you. And then Sahaba were questioning. They said, who? Is this a victory? All the deal? points to one side, it's favoring the non-Muslims, nothing on our side. But it was something they couldn't see at that moment. 
it, that came from inspiration from Allah, trusting Allah, being connected with Allah. And later on, they found out that was the best decision they could have made. It's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One thing we fall victim to, my dear brothers and sisters, is that when we have people under us, like your children, for example, you sometimes get disappointed. You say, this is not who I wanted him to be or who I expected him to be. And you look and you focus on the defects, even with your wife. You know, at the first glance, it's love at first sight. The honeymoon's amazing. And then what happens? All of a sudden, shaitan has trapped you into looking at what she doesn't have. And the Prophet Sallallahu he alluded to not doing this. He said, لَا يَفْرُقُ مُؤْمِنُ مُؤْمِنَةً أَوْ لَا يَظْلِمُهَا He doesn't wrong, a believer doesn't wrong a believing woman. And then what does he say? He says, إِنْ كَرِهَ مِنْهَا خُلُقًا رَضِيَ مِنْهَا آخر. If he dislikes some flaw of hers, let him look for the one that he loves. There's going to be something that's equal, maybe more. You know, a professor did an, a, a, a study for some children in the, in the school and basically handed him a, a piece of white paper with a black dot in the middle. And then he asked them to tell him what they saw. They all said, we see a black dot. The whole example of the exercise was to show them they're focusing on the smallest thing in the paper. They didn't see all the white around it. That's what we do. So what was once a blessing, children, wives, and all the blessings Allah has given us, all of a sudden because we are not in the habit of being grateful, we look at the things that we don't have. We look at the small little defects, and we let that ruin our relationship. Look at the insight. Let's do a case study. In Surah Al-Kahf, Allah talks about Zul Qarnayn as an example of a good leader. Now many of you may have read his passage, and as we're encouraged to every Friday, let us take a look at some of the things I want to highlight for you to display what a good leader looks like. We don't know Dhul Qarnayn's name. Many people have thrown some names in history. That's not the point. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَن Dhul Qarnayn They ask you about this great man. They call him the king of the two horns because he ruled from east to west. قُلْ سَأَتْلُ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْهُ ذِكْرًا I'm going to make mention some things that are important for you to know about him. إِنَّ مَكَنَّا لَهُ فِي الْأَرْضِ one thing you should know is that Zul Qarnayn was given resources and the means, but he didn't stop there. He says, He took those means and utilized them for the greater good. Propagating justice all over the world, propagating Islam as they knew it at that time. So he didn't sit on the talents and things he was given because all of us have been given one thing or another. Some talent, some expertise, some knowledge some energy, whatever, Allah has blessed us all. We should look into what Allah has given us and use them and let, don't let it just sit there, but utilize them and activate them. And so what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He passes by, He traverses the world until He meets a people. حَتَّى إِذَا بَلَقَ بَيْنَ السَّدَيْنِ Between the two passageways, وَجَدَ مِن دُونِهِمَا قَوْمًا لَا يَكَادُونَ يَفْقَهُونَ قَوْلًا they, He found the people, what we consider to be uncivilized. No knowledge. They don't know how to read. They don't know how to write. You know, they don't have any ability. Some may look down upon such a people. But he didn't look down upon them. He looked at what they had to offer. They asked him, قَالُوا يَا قَرْنَيْنِ إِنَّ يَأْجُوجَ وَمَأْجُوجَ مُفْسِدُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ يَأْجُوجَ وَمَأْجُوجَ are a people who have caused corruption in the land. They're causing havoc. فَهَلْ نَجْعَلُ لَكَ خَرْجًا عَلَىٰ أَن تَجْعَلَ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَهُمْ سَدًّا Shall we not pay you a tribute, we'll compensate you to help us erect a barrier between us and them. Now somebody might say, you know what, these people have no hope. I'm just going to build the gate and make my way. I have the resources, right? He could have just done that and made his way. But what Zul Qarnayn did was he says, قَالَ مَا مَكَّنِّي فِيهِ رَبِّي خَيْرٍ What Allah has given me is enough. Allah has blessed me with much good. But what I do need from you is manpower. He wanted them to help themselves. He wanted to improve them. He didn't focus on their defects and say to them, you know what, I'm just going to do it for you and, and you guys will be alright. First thing he did, he says, I'm going to need you to help yourselves. I'm going to help you and I don't need no money from you, but I need you to work. So he gives them instruction and he says, I'm not going to build for you a sedda. You wanted a sedda, which is a barrier. I'm going to build for you a radma. He responded by saying something that's even better. 
a more fortified wall that could withstand earthquakes, something that's going to last for a long, long time. So a good leader doesn't just hear what his uh, constituents or his family or whoever he's leader over, he doesn't just you know, hear their requests and give them exactly what they want. Sometimes he looks out for the vision of the future. He looks out for their true betterment. And he says, you know what? I'm going to give you something better than what you asked for. Because I know what's good. I'm a leader. I've been given hikmah, knowledge and wisdom from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then at the end, when he finally erected this great structure with a people who had no knowledge of engineering or architecture, he built something magnificent. He didn't let his ego inflate and say, look what I've done for you. At the end, he says, هذا رحمة من ربي. This is a mercy from my Lord. He attributed this back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help them be people who believe in who? Not him. In Allah. Anytime you give something good, you make sure people remind, uh, remind them that it came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that you have done a great job. You've done da'wah by helping them. And you've led them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَقُولِ قَوْلِ هَذَا أَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ لِي وَلَكُمْ فَاسْتَغْفِرُوا إِنَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى أهله وأصحابه أجمعين Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has guided us to this way of life and had it not been for Allah's guidance we would not have been guided and praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has sent upon his messenger Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم the final book in which there is no crookedness in it إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما أما بعد My dear brothers and sisters Dhu Al-Qarnayn saw the defects and he turned them into greatness There's an African proverb that says If you want to go fast, go by yourself But if you want to go far, go together And that's what Allah tries to instill in us in the Quran It's not just about you You may be you know, you may have the talents and you may have the skills, but it shouldn't stop there. You should try to bring everybody with you. And that's why whenever we say in the, in the Quran, in Surah Al-Fatiha, we always speak in the plural form, right? There's always a plurality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to understand. And at the end, a, a leader should know he is the servant of the people. Because it's through that good heart, of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam that he was selected for the mission. Ibn Mas'ud says a statement. He says, نَذَرَ اللَّهِ إِلَىٰ قُلُوبِ الْعِبَادِ فَوَجَدَ خَيْرَ قَلْبٍ قَلْبِ مُحَمَّدٍ صلى الله عليه وسلم. He says, Allah, when he was creating the creation, he looked at the hearts of every man and he saw that the best heart was the heart of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He cared the most. So it was befitting that he be receiving that mission of delivering Islam to the people as he was rahmatan lil'alameen, a mercy to the worlds. And if you look at his seerah, look at his example, undoubtedly he is our greatest role model. You look at the Battle of Badr for instance. He was a general, a commander. Yet he, because of the limited resources, had to share in a riding animal. Ibn Mas'ud says in the Ghazwat al-Badr, Kullu, uh, uh, all of us had to share one riding animal. Kullu wa'ad ala rahila. Kullu thalath ala rahila. Three people riding one camel. So Ibn Mas'ud says it was the Prophet وسلم, Ali radiallahu anhu and Abu Lubaba. And he says when it was time for the Prophet's turn to walk, they said to him, O oh, Messenger of Allah, you remain there, we're going to continue walking. And he says to them, no, I'm going to walk just like you. I'm not free of need from the reward of Allah. I need the reward just as much as you. In any civilization, any general walking with the soldier, suffering and going through the same ordeals, it's unheard of. But the Prophet said he wanted to make an example. I'm not different than you. He had mercy for the, 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 the most vulnerable member of his congregation. One day in the Fajr prayer, as they're praying Fajr, and it was the habit of Rasulullah to make the Fajr prayer longer than the rest of the prayers. But this time he made it short, he cut it short. So they asked him, O oh, Messenger of Allah, why have you made Fajr short today? He says, Samirtu buka murdi'in. He says, I heard the crying of an infant who was. It seemed like he was talking to his mother. As if he was asking his mother something. So I wanted to uh, have mercy on him. So I cut the prayer short. 
You know, he's thinking about a baby among all the senior sahabas, all the men here, but he's thinking about that baby who may be suffering. So he cuts the prayer short. This was the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And Abu Bakr learned from him, you know, when Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, uh, when the Prophet passed away, he took the position of leadership, Khalifa to Rasulullah. And his, in, in his inauguration speech, what does he say? He says, فَإِنِّي قَدْ وُلِّيْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَلَسْتُ بِخَيْرِكُمْ I've been made in charge of you, but, I, but I'm not the best of you. He says, فَإِنْ أَحْسَنْتُ فَعَيْنُونِي If I do good, help me. I need your support. وَإِنْ أَسَأْتُ فَقَوَّمُونِي And if I, do, if I do wrong, then I need you to correct me. A leader is not afraid to be criticized for the good. Right? If someone is advising him, he takes an advice and he uses it to uh, improve the situation of his people. We close off with this. At the end, the final product of a good leader should be that he's loved by his people and his people love him. Hadith is Awf ibn Malik anhu in, in Sahih Muslim in which he says, قَالَ سَمِعْتُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ يَقُولُ I heard the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه say, خَيْرَ أَئِمَّتُكُمْ الَّذِينَ تُحِبُّونَهُمْ وَيُحِبُّونَكُمْ The best of your leaders are those who you love and they love you. It's out of love, right? There's love there. وَتُصَلُّونَ عَلَيْهِمْ وَيُصَلُّونَ عَلَيْكُمْ And they pray for you and you pray for them. There's genuine care for one another. This is what the product of a good leader. He says, وَشِرَارَ إِمَّتُكُمْ And the worst of your leaders are الَّذِينَ تَبْغُدُونَهُمْ وَيَبْغُدُونَكُمْ Those whom you hate and they hate you. وَتَلْعُنُونَهُمْ وَيَلْعُنُونَكُمْ And you curse them and they curse you. It's about force and hard, hardness and my way or the highway. قَالَ قُلْنَا يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ They asked the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam If we get such leaders that we hate and we despise He says what should we do? Should we not remove them? Should we not rebel? أَفَلَا نُنَابِذُهُمْ قَالَ لَا مَا قَامُوا فِيكُمُ الصَّلَاةِ Don't as long as they establish salah So that there is order maintained If they're establishing salah Let it pass They will be asked And Allah will deal with them But he says the best of your leaders Are those who do it out of love this is a reciprocation. When you care for your children, when you care for the people, do it out of genuine concern and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help you and he will help you to, to lead a people and to be example for the righteous.